Thank you all for coming. I know this is a, a busy time of the semester with final exams and things. Thank you for taking the time. Thanks for Ferran and Lisa for organizing these events for the last two years. Uh, and thank you all for, for coming to all of them as well. Um, this presentation is probably less well developed than most. And when I know a lot of people say that this is a work in progress, that it really is a first cut, and I really am open for suggestions. This is definitely one of those cases in which I am sincere. Um, this is part of a larger uh, project in which I'm looking at election violence globally. And this paper is was my excuse to try to narrow down to a level in which I can really start looking at the, the mechanisms that I was looking at at a really general level and really apply it to a specific case and see whether that specific case, whether it makes sense, uh, what makes sense, what doesn't, uh, and what I could actually get out of this kind of study. So from a more general um, perspective to kind of motivate why I'm studying this and why you guys should be interested in, in sitting through the, the next 30 minutes or so, is basically if you read the newspaper and you see a lot of instances of political violence and instability surrounding elections. The one, if you've heard of any instance of election violence, it's probably likely to be after the December 2011 um, election, in, uh, presidential election in Kenya. Uh, I was in grad, uh, in grad school and one of my friends was a Kikuyu and we followed it day, day in and day out with the, the violence spreading uh, different groups in different parts of the country. And I think it sparked an interest in both policymakers as well as academics in trying to understand why in one of those countries that's usually looked at as being a bastion of stability and, and development, although with increasing corruption over the last two or three decades, something like this can just flare up out of uh, what's seen as um, out, of, out of nothing. Um, so in Kenya, there was an election in, uh, in 2007, and then another one in 2013, and there wasn't any, hardly any election violence at all. Uh, another type of uh, election violence, and a case that you might have heard of, uh, was the assassination um, by shooting and then uh, bomb, by good measure, of the two-time former prime minister of uh, Pakistan, Benazir Bhutto, who had uh, recently returned from exile uh, to, to help run in the uh, legislative elections, um, and she was killed within, I believe, two months of actually touching down. One, uh, one other case that you might be familiar with, uh, Cote d'Ivoire. This is a case uh, in which it was also seen as a relatively stable and prosperous a uh, country that it had uh, um, a stability and a civil war broke out. There was a peace process in 2002, and then uh, an election in which the long-serving uh, leader, Laurent Gbagbo, in the lower left, um, lost the election to Alessandro Ouattara, uh, who had been a former economist at the World Bank. Um, the the person who won refused to concede, uh, Bagbo, ended up splitting the country pretty much along the lines of the, the areas of control uh, that occurred during the Civil War, um, ended up escalating for a couple of months and really didn't really end until French troops touched down. Ended up uh, arresting uh, Laurent Bagbo. This is a photo of him looking quite unhappy in his hotel, in his palace after being arrested uh, and is now being tried uh, for um, I believe for crimes against humanity. Lastly, um, Nepal, in an area in which that had um, long history of monarchy and relative stability, uh, a quite unequal society, uh, civil war broke out in 1996, lasted until 2006, part of the peace process. They called for an election uh, to an assembly that would draft a new constitution that should help uh, uh, solidify the peace process and bring former combatants into the political process including um, Prachanda, the head of the, um, the Maoist rebel group who had um, been the main opposition to the government uh, for the decade. Um, in 2008, when the election was actually held, uh, there was a lot of instability and violence. Uh, that lasted a couple months after the end of the election. Um, and when you think at it more generally, you see these um, uh, cases of election violence. Um, and it has a real, we've been studying election integrity for the last two years, and Pippa's been studying it for a lot longer. 
And one of the greatest threats, what a lot of people talk about, uh, to the democratic process, as well as to the stability of peace, is uh, the use of violence and instability surrounding the election process. And so what this project, more generally, is trying to do is trying to understand uh, the motivations for it. And, um, and ideally, uh, you can get actors in to help prevent it. The talk today, just to give you an outline that, yes, it is going to end. Basically, I start with uh, a motivation more specifically, looking at concepts, uh, how I design my empirical studies, talk about results for a little bit, and then conclusions, and, and definitely try to get your feedback about what you liked, what you didn't like, what you bought, and what you didn't bought. Starting off, why, why study election violence? Uh, why bother it? Uh, bother studying it? My motivating question, of course, like most people, is an empirical puzzle. Um, more and more countries since the end of the Cold War are holding elections, and in a number of countries that do have an experience at holding relatively peaceful elections, uh, instability, protests, and violence can often flare up when uh, domestic actors might ne not necessarily expect it, or, or, or they might, or when international actors are plugging in a lot of money into the country in, in, uh, in trying to increase stability. Um, so why? Right? With more experience, they should get better at it, institutions should become more ingrained, um, and so the process should become more peaceful instead of less peaceful. People should be more used to working within the system instead of going without the system. Um, election violence, as defined, is going outside the legitimate political system. And the motivating questions, I guess, for me, more generally, as well as for this, uh, for this paper, is who's doing it, right? Who's doing it and why? Trying to understand the motivations uh, whether it's at the elite level, whether, whether it's at the mass level, uh, whether it's a particular type of political party, who's doing, uh, who are using these techniques and trying to understand why. And in a specific subset of elections, the ones that should be arguably at greatest risk of actually having violence, those countries that have recently had a civil war in which violence uh, outside the traditional uh, state system was used uh, in order to advance political goals. When there is peace, those countries that um, hold elections right afterwards, in the 1990s after the end of the Cold War, and in, as we've seen in the US and Iraq and Afghanistan, often one of the things the international parties that help draft the peace, one of the first things they want to call for is elections, sooner rather than later, often within a year or two of the end of the Civil War. Now, within the last five, 10 years, um, a, a international actors have started to say, OK, Maybe we don't want to rush to the polls, because often elections can lead uh, to a recurrence of uh, flare-up of violence. So are these countries <coughs> that are emerging from civil wars, is something um, special or different about them? And how can this end up uh, creating challenges for um, institutionalized elections and, and stability? Another uh, motivation for why we should study it uh, is the fact that what I'm what's currently studying is becoming less relevant and less frequent. Uh, these uh, use of violence by political actors, there's been a couple of different types. Back in uh, the Cold War, it was often uh, proxy wars, proxy civil wars, or interstate wars. Civil wars, as you can see, um, spiked uh, in the 90s with the independence and the, the push for uh, democratization uh, within a lot of uh, lesser developed states. Um, but since 2000, Roughly, the number of civil wars uh, has been going down. Uh, more and more peace processes have, have been occurring, and the civil wars that do occur are becoming less deadly. And so what often we're seeing now is where the trends are shifting, maybe uh, the actors are just using different techniques in trying, in trying to advance political goals. And so right here, you see definitely a non-monotonic trend. Right, You see a gradual uh, decline in civil war, and then I have another graph uh, in which you see election violence, and it's increasing, uh, right? Uh, the, the frequency of elections, even after controlling for the increasing frequency of elections, the elections that are being held are more likely to experience uh, violence. This is using NELDA's data, NELDA 33, uh, that you see this overall increasing trend um, in the frequency of elections that, that have violence. So from a normative standpoint, as well as an academic standpoint, it's interesting to try to understand why this is occurring. Is there something different about elections now than maybe 20 years ago? And to try to understand what the stakes are and who the actor, actors are as a way uh, to try to prevent it, right? From a normative standpoint, uh, 
Um, some of you not, might not be familiar, but the EIP, we ran a security workshop in conjunction with APSA. Uh, it was four, four days long, and we flew in the uh, election commissions of Nepal and Afghanistan, two countries that definitely have challenges facing uh, both uh, civil conflict as well as insecurity, and we were trying to think, how can we make the academic research that we're doing relevant to these policymakers, people who are actually on the ground? Uh, and so one of the goals and one of the ideas when trying to look at a, a, a subnational study is give them some findings that might be useful for when they actually try to organize elections or to delegate security services to see where the risk is greatest, try to understand who are the actors that need to be uh, brought into the system or can have uh, increasing risk of, of being involved. Um, and then more generally, how this fits into my overall uh, research and, and uh, how it kind of fits into the, uh, I'm a civil conflict scholar. I did my dissertation on civil conflict, um, the political economy of it, and the, the rise in non-state actors. And what uh, I think elections kind of fit nicely in these three areas in which I've worked. Traditional conflict, uh, election integrity and democracy, and then uh, human rights. Because often when you see in elections, uh, in, the, in the Kenyan case, I think I mentioned it, you might not have seen it uh, at the top of the slide, but Amnesty International recently came out with a report saying that there was over 40,000 instances of gender-based violence. So everyone talked about the uh, 1,000 people who died, but there is a lot of human rights violations, systematic rape uh, campaigns that can really have a long standing effect that uh, almost a decade after there really is an effect. So I, I'm interested in this topic because it kind of covers all three of these general areas. Um, and when I, when I try to start to think about election violence, I'm, I can talk about the literature for much longer than you guys would ever probably want to, but I try to put it in an existing framework that I'm used to. And I, I'll admit that I'm a, a positivist, and I think of basically agent, uh, a lot of political phenomena as, shape, uh, as being shaped by structure and agents, right? Um, that you have, you can think of it as a, as a uh, I like um, arcade games, right? That you have, the structure given by the, the board, and then you have, you control the flippers. You as the actor has some control over when things happen or what direction you might be able to set trajectory, but the overall structure is slower uh, moving unless you open the trip. Sometimes though I get a little pessimistic and then maybe it's, it's less uh, that arcade game than, than Pachinko in which you basically have no control and that the system basically can set you stochastically towards one particular end or another, right? But I like, I like to think that it's a combination of trying to understand the structure in which actors or the, the, the ball uh, finds itself and then you can kind of set the direction, of course. Sometimes it, it seems that structure, and my findings suggest that maybe it's the structure uh, that, that has uh, an important effect. And more than, more than most papers, and I'm sure that uh, ben, uh, ben deserves an award for having to read through what is definitely an early stage, and basically I'm in my Pollock stage, right? Where I'm basically <laughs> throwing everything on the screen, uh, on, on the page. I'm taking bits from, uh, from grant applications from the, the first chapter of the book, and then things specific to the to the specific country, but um, I'm definitely interested to see what colors or, or what patterns you, you guys find more more interesting. All right, so moving on to the basic concepts and looking at uh, election violence more specifically, uh, one difficulty we face uh, in both defining when in defining any kind of political violence, but in election violence, I think. Um, faces an issue that's similar to terrorism and civil conflict is defining what it is and what it isn't. And a lot of people can argue about what would be considered election violence. There's some literature that says terrorism attacks uh, by terrorist groups spike around the election uh, phase because it gets them more attention, makes them more relevant uh, for their political goals. Um, uh, civil conflicts, the number of battles has also been found to spike roughly around civil, uh, election violence. And so what 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 I'm trying to do is trying to find out, okay, in the larger project, what is election violence, who are the actors, and when should it count? When is it, uh, when is it tied to the election, and when is it something that's, that's distinct, right? Um, and, and Margarita, you were talking about that too also, when you're trying to, to look at these kind of data and say, when is it this, and, and, and when is it not? So for, for the case of this paper, and then just in general, I'm adopting uh, IFIS's definition, uh, Jeff Fisher, uh, 
uh, he wrote an early piece in 2002 that defines election violence as any random or organized act that seeks to determine, delay, or otherwise influence an election process through threat, verbal intimidation, hate speech, different disinformation. So you notice the first four don't actually involve actually using violence, but the implicit threat of violence the, that can often be more effective in getting people to do what you want without actually having to pay the cost of actually doing it. Um, physical assault, force protection, blackmail, destruction of property, and assassination, those are actually specific violent acts that can be uh, directed um, at both groups of people as well as individuals, as we saw with the Benazir Bhutto uh, individual assassination. Now, the literature more generally focuses on um, more uh, of the protest. They conceive of it more as random protests, bottom-up, people are dissatisfied with the result, take to the streets and use violence. And what I'm really trying to say um, in, the, in the broader work in here is that it's often strategic, it's often used by political elites for a political goal, and often they can um, uh, use it in order to affect the outcome. So that's, uh, that's definitely relevant to uh, affecting the election process, but I think What's important to be clear is different parts, different characteristics, different types of election violence are used by different actors at different stages of the election process, and that we have to be clear about what we're talking about when we're actually talking about election violence. And so what I try to do here is kind of break it up into different pieces. When you try to explain anything, I, I go back to Conan Doyle, right? You need the means, motive, and opportunity in trying to understand the, the act, right? And so when your explanations, a lot of the explanations that I'm really trying to touch on in the paper overlap with uh, a couple of these. But when you're trying to think about what are the causal, what are the causal mechanisms, you can see which one it might uh, play into. Does it uh, help make um, the means more available if, if I hand you a pipe and $200 uh, or an improvised explosive device, right? Um, the motive, if the government has been keeping my ethnic group marginalized and not distributed a lot of public goods for the last 20 years, uh, does that systematically affect uh, motivation, opportunity? If you're in a part of the country that the government hasn't really been able to control for the last 20 years, does that make it easier for you to be able to use intimidation uh, uh, against the population or against the opposition candidates to make you more likely to win? So when trying to look at the, the events, I try to fit it into this kind of uh, heuristic. So of course there's an existing literature and I, uh, I, people are often tempted to spend more time showing that they read the literature than to show my models. Uh, so I'm more than happy to talk about the existing literature in, in the Q&A. Um, but generally, when looking at election violence, you can, there's two words, right? You can approach it from one or the other. You can approach it from the election side, um, that looking at it more of as, a, as a tactic and a background condition, or the conflict side. Um, and the conflict literature is, is getting more and more into elections, but it's mostly understanding uh, conflict leading to elections rather than the other way around, put more generally. Um, my general theoretical argument, I break it up into these three dynamics. A structural, um, that background conditions uh, in Pachinko, election dynamics, things that happen during the election process, and then conflict dynamics, legacies uh, of conflict within a country. So um, structural conditions, those are the things that are slow, uh, more slow, um, change more slowly. Geography is probably the most slow, uh, slowest changing um, characteristic uh, within a state that could, that could affect stability and, and state capacity. Uh, economic development, how many people you are, all things being equal, the, the literature finds. The, the more people you have, the more likely you're gonna have some subset that's gonna be angry enough or be willing to be hired enough to, to actually use violence. Um, education, more educated people should be less likely to give, to give everything up and to use violence. In my courses, I try to talk my students into organizing a rebel group, you know, poli sci 101 uh, rebel group. We were going to have a flag, we were going to start a war, and it, it's never happened because these students, especially the ones that the um, that want to go to law school, have these opportunity costs that are that are not going to be able to be dissuaded. Um, so employment levels, if you don't have a job, uh, other kind of political characteristics that can shape uh, the likelihood, uh, the means, the motive, and the opportunity structural uh, characteristics can affect. Election dynamics, this is when I'm getting into newer territory. The literature has only just started, um, Hafner Burton, Hyden Jablonski, I think is, is one that, that starts to look at 
the election process before the election and after the election, who uses election violence before the election or after the election, uh, and how actions in one can affect the other. They also look at public polling to look at potentially how competitive an, an election is. And um, the only other work that really looks at election dynamics that I'm familiar with is just looking at dummy variables over the election period, that basically the closer you are to election day, the more likely you are uh, to have violence. I, I can definitely think of a lot of other characteristics about an election process that would, that would make you more likely to use violence. Uh, the electoral integrity, of course, um, the, the financing of the actors, the, their, um, the stakes of the election, um, whether different parties boycott an election in Nepal. A number of parties boycotted both in 2008 and 2013, and once they did that, they actually uh, encouraged people to not vote, and, and there were some allegations that they used violent tactics in order to prevent people from going to the polls in order to give it to legitimacy. So that's a bunch of different dynamics. Uh, another one that I that I uh, that I came up with um, that is less well developed is is looking at uh, the, the gender dynamics of election violence. Gabrielle Bardal, she's coming uh, to EIP next semester. She's done some work for, I believe it was was for IFAS, looking at how, uh, as in Kenya, that there's definitely gender dynamics in who's targeted, as well as um, whether in U.S. comparative politics, the more um, women who are in legislator, uh, legislatures that are in parliaments, the less worth like they are um, in, in some comparative literature. So I'm, I'm interested in trying to look at the specific dynamics of, uh, of um, g uh, gender dynamics of, of elections. And then lastly, the, the conflict part, right? Since I'm, looking, I'm interested in looking at conflict states, um, is there a legacy of conflict that, that can lead to instability and violence? First of all, it can be the scorched, uh, the scorched earth can have an effect. The number of people killed, how much damage, how much violence an area saw uh, from Calabas' work in, in the civil conflict literature, you can see that there's a lot of legacy um, looking at that. Um, it also could play a part, as we saw in the Cote d'Ivoire um, map, that you had this conflict dynamic, you had the north and the south, and then after the election dynamic, when the violence happened, it pretty much matched along that specific dynamic. And you can make an argument that it was partly due to the conflict and that certain groups con uh, controlled certain areas. However, you can also take it a step back and say that it's, it's actually structural. It's the ethnic di um, dis uh, distribution within a country or the economic uh, level of development within a country. So I'm interested in looking at these three areas uh, uh, more generally. And what I'm trying to do with this paper um, is more of a proof of concept is I'm a quantitative cross-national large N kind of guy and what I really want to do and what I see the literature really trying to do is to say okay we can find general trends across all elections cross-nationally I want to see whether it can apply in one particular country in one particular election and look at it in more fine grain to actually look at the narrative aspect of it. So that's what I'm, I'm really interested in trying to do with one particular case. So briefly, wow. um, uh, thank you for staying awake. I don't see any close eyes yet. Looking at the structural factors for the empirical models and in the arguments, I'm just trying some simple ones, uh, largely taken from my cross-national arguments. Education, uh, hypothesis about education, geography, and levels of economic development within a particular country. There is subnational variation. I come from the US. I've lived in both Louisiana and California. There's a lot of variation within the country. There's a lot of variation in electric, uh, election dynamics. Nepal is, is, is also uh, the case. Election dynamics as well, as we saw with the midterms in the US, turnout was, um, was incredibly low. In Nepal as well, in other countries, there's a lot of variation with the stakes within the election. I argue that the more competitive, the closer the elections. The Kenyan election in 2007, part of the reason for elections, um, election violence sparking was because between the two candidates, the gap was incredibly small. It was within uh, one or two percentage points. And the loser, Odinga, uh, ended up protesting and saying that there was enough systematic fraud that he actually won. Similar case uh, was also the case in Cote d'Ivoire. So I'm arguing that the closer <coughs> the elections are, that's both an indication of the stakes of the election, but then also an area in which both sides think that they have a uh, probability of actually winning. 
timing, uh, borrowing this from Basana Gandhi, that basically you don't, you can't just look at an election period in uh, in six months or a year. You really need to look at these things change from day to day, week to week, and that with election timing, uh, there's a systematic risk when parties are registering during the campaign period, election day, and the aftermath of election. You need to really try to better understand the variation that happens over time. And then I also mentioned the gender dynamics. The only one that I could think of that I would match with data that I actually had was looking at um, female candidates. There is some literature in comparative politics that looks at political female candidates. And Nepal is a very traditional society. There's, uh, there really hasn't been any female representation in, um, in the few elections that they had since, uh, since independence. And so as part of the peace process, they mandated in the political process that uh, half of the candidates in the proportional representation side that I'll get to in a bit had to be female candidates. And what I'm looking at is the, the actual um, single member district, uh, first past the post part of things to try to look at whether women actually did well. That's an indication of a systematically different approach to understanding politics that might shape the, uh, the views of whether election violence is actually uh, acceptable or not. Lastly, conflict dynamics. This is one that I could really go into in, in more depth. And at a subnational level, I'm really quite limited at this stage in how I think about trying to capture conflict dynamics. From a cross-national perspective, some of you might have seen at Kuji. I was looking at all the machine-coded uh, GDAL data, cross-nationally looking at strategy, looking at the use of threats by government and the opposition. I talk a little bit about that in, in the paper and looking at the back and forth, looking at the stra uh, strategic use of that. With conflict, I all, there's definitely a, a strategy. I really had a hard time trying to look at it due to data availability, so I came up with a rough kind of measure of how bad the conflict was, and that was just the number of people who died during the decade of uh, conflicts uh, within a country, uh, within, within uh, the country of Nepal. All right, so for those of you who might not be familiar with this, Really tiny uh, landlocked country uh, that basically sits in between uh, India and Nepal. A little bit of background because I think it's important to try to understand both modeling decisions as well as the specific election dynamics for the one election that I'm looking at. Um, it's basically broken up into three, um, three zones. You have the lowlands, which is bordering India. You have the hill area, uh, which uh, is basically, these are in the Himalayas and it basically rises from, from sea level or pretty close to sea level up to the highest point in the world, Mount Everest, uh, at the border um, uh, with Tibet. And so you have the mountain area, the ecological area, and um, the hill area, and then the, the Terai. And the population and the infrastructure pretty much matches um, the ease with which uh, people can actually move around. So when I look at elections, a lot of the districts within the country, there aren't actually roads to yet. So as in India, it can be quite a logistical challenge actually having the polling places and where you ended up seeing a lot of violence, which is in areas in which there weren't any roads. And so while this is gradually changing, um, last time I was there, I went out to, uh, to Jiri and to the Everest region. They've extended a road up about 20 or 30 miles that direction, also in the Annapurna region outside of Babylon. So they're gradually stretching the roads out, but there's still areas. It's, a, it's, it's, um, it's considered a least developed country by the World Bank. It's incredibly poor. Um, and so the, the state capacity and the, the distribution of people is clustered down in the south and the Terai bordering with India. So a bit about the election that I'm actually looking at. Um, so yeah, the Civil War happened between 1996 and 2006. As part of the peace process, they called for a constituency election to draw uh, up a, uh, a constitution um, that was supposed to be held in 2007, but it was delayed. Interim constitution in January, um, new parliament was tasked with drafting it, failed to do so. They had another election in 2013. I was reading the newspapers there yesterday, and then basically everyone keeps on saying, okay, we need to do it but all the actors refused to actually sign off uh, on, the, uh, on the Constitution. Part of the peace process, they had a mixed system to try to um, address concerns that were important in the Civil War. Basically, it was a, it was a caste-based society in which you had the ruling castes um, 
was were very consistent. The monarchy ruled. Uh, occasional experiments with elections, but the, the legislatures never really had that much power. The Maoists, um, which the Chinese Maoists, uh, the Chinese government completely disavowed. They said they weren't really Maoists, they were their own Maoists. Uh, and they've, they've, uh, they've since splintered. There's a couple of different groups. There's both uh, the Communist Party Maoists, there's the Communist Party Marxist-Leninists, there's a couple of other splinter uh, parties, but what they really tapped into during the conflict was the inequality, was the lack of representation and opportunity that the Monarchical government really um, uh, had, for, uh, had for millennia. So they called for a mixed electoral system to both bring uh, ethnic minorities into the government um, as, well as, uh, as well as women. So they had uh, 240 first-past-the-post single-member district seats individual candidates on individual ballots and individual consistency uh, constituencies, and then uh, a PR system. Um, so it's it's really interesting mix, 601 total seats. In the 2008 election, the Maoists cleaned up. They, uh, th during the campaign period, they really threatened to go back to the jungle if they didn't do well. There was a lot of intimidation, there was a lot of violence. The violence that ended up happening usually was held, uh, was um, committed by two groups. The Maoists and the Mahezi uh, uh, dissatisfied groups uh, along the Terai that had been, um, they weren't able to get identifications to vote because they were considered Indian. They weren't really Nepali. There was a lot of cross border, the border is a border in name only. And so they weren't really considered Nepali by the ruling class. And so it's a lot of dissatisfaction there. Um, in this first election, the Maoists won a distinct uh, majority, they won 120. Of the first pass of the 240 first pass the post seats, 100 of the PR, uh, and the other party that had been ruling or that had won the major elections back in the 1990s before the war, um, they they didn't do well. However, in the 2013 election that happened um, just last year, the Maoists got absolutely slaughtered. The one risk of actually governing is that you have expectations to actually govern. And a lot of people were dissatisfied with what they were able to do in power, and then they were they were they were shoved out of power in the 2013 election. Briefly, Nepal has two, uh, 240 co uh, constituencies in 75 districts, uh, and um, this is just an overall snapshot that shows really the magnitude of the uh, the Maoist uh, victory. And basically, uh, this is another approach at using data that most of the 54 uh, percent of the, uh, the victims were uh, political actors in, in some way. For my project, what I did is I looked at um, the United Nations have created security incident maps in Nepal every month since 2005. To basically, uh, the UN, there's, it's, it's similar to Uganda in Africa. It's an area in which a lot of nonprofits go into because it's it's fun to be a, a, a tourist NGO worker there. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. There's a lot of needs um, having to do with um, uh, uh, water access, uh, agriculture, basic human health. So there's a lot of organizations there as a way to, to coordinate a lot of the data that created these monthly maps. I've used these monthly maps and turned them into data. I'm more than happy to talk about them uh, later on. But basically, this gives a monthly snapshot of where the incidents happened uh, around the election that I'm, what I'm looking at. And so to give you a sense of my data, uh, I find similar to what the, uh, the London non nonprofit did, that the vast majority of the victims were political cadres or, or um, uh, political supporters, candidates, and the most frequent methods used in political violence in, in, um, in Nepal during 2008 were explosives, uh, second to guns and firearms. So it, uh, there were a lot of clashes between groups in which these were actually used, but a lot of it was more uh, targeted intimidation against opposition forces, uh, given the data that, that I've looked at. And again, this is a, a new process for me. No one's really looked at election data besides, is there election violence, right? The, the NELDA data, was there violence associated with an election? Uh, in the follow-up articles, they said, was there violence before or after the election? And so this, this research is really getting much more fine-grained detail across time and by methods and by actors to really look at who's doing what where, right? And so just looking at it across time, in the 2008 election, I just looked at the frequency of the incidents to see, again, that election timing does matter. 
The blue line is the 2008 election, the red is the 2013. 2013, definitely less violent. But you see the spikes uh, roughly when they're campaigning the registration as well as the uh, election, uh, elect, election month itself. So you do see a lot of variation across time. I've, I'm, when you talk about something you're interested in, you can get into it. So forgive me for, for going on. Briefly, for my quantitative models, again, uh, if I don't use Stata, I get kind of twitchy for a while. And so I did run some empirical models. They're very preliminary. I'm looking forward to your results, uh, to your thoughts. First of all, it's just a general measure of the level of security incidents. Um, from between a zero and four measure of just w was there incidents in a district and then how, uh, how intense it was. I'm kind of building off of Strauss and Taylor. They have a study in uh, looking at African election violence and they kind of create a similar kind of scheme. The argument being that higher levels is more of a threat to the political process. I also have a measure of IEDs, right, because that's the most frequent type of election violence used in Nepal. Clashes between different organizations. And uh, um, Nepal is big on kidnappings, uh, both for, for money as well as for a form of intimidation. There's a lot of abductions and kidnappings. So I also use, uh, look at that as a measure to kind of see if these kind of structural election, election dynamics vary across um, different types of violence. I limit it due to my, the data that I currently have correct, uh, collected to, um, to districts from February. The election was in April, so from February until July, uh, the overall election time period. And then I use, uh, if for the categorical variables, I use ordered logit, dicot material tools, I use logit. Uh, I have imperfect proxies of the structural election and uh, conflict dynamics, of course. Uh, and I'm more ha than happy to talk about these in more detail in, in the Q&A. Um, but uh, basically, they're similar to what I was talking about in uh, a bit earlier. Um, and then, yeah, dummies for election months. Results, I will, I, I believe you guys got the handouts with the election tables. I'm not going to subject you to really small uh, fonts uh, and um, coefficients. So basically, I made a couple of summary graphs. I have three graphs of the results, so please bear with me. Um, basically, the first one is looking at the, uh, the level of security incidents from zero to four, and the other ones are election violence over the entire time period, and then narrowing it only to the election month to be able to capture what actually happened during the, uh, during the election. And what we see is that um, really the, for, the, for the ordered logit, the population, uh, again, these are just coefficients, so since population varies quite a lot within districts. The coefficients are likely to be small. I'm going to look at substantive effects in a second. But basically, statistically significantly, uh, effects are found for higher populations lead to more levels of incidence. Being based towards that lower part of the country, uh, just as a dummy variable, those areas were systematically more likely to have violent events. And then, uh, yeah, not much else for the election timing uh, or the election outcomes. The, the bars are the confidence intervals, and the dots are the coefficients. So if the bars cross that line, that means we can't reject that there's no relationship between uh, the x variable and the y variable at the 95% level. Moving on to the dichotomous measures for use of violence, looking at IED explosions within the district, uh, we see that population for both IEDs, clashes, and abductions, IEDs in red, clashes in blue, abductions in green, that uh, higher populations are more likely to have IEDs, all else being held equal. Um, the percent labor force in non-agricultural jobs, uh, that was a measure for me of uh, opportunity costs as well as industrialization, economic development, clustering of people within groups that actually, uh, as that grows higher, you're systematically more likely to see um, two out of the three not abductions. Uh, and then for uh, election months, pretty much for all of them, they're more likely to, to have violence than three months after the election, which I use as being kind of a baseline. Uh, and then what was surprising for me is that um, the number of people getting at the conflict dynamics the only statistically significant effect for the number of people killed in war was for abductions. It reduced, uh, well actually for IEDs, um, it's just, it's hard to tell here, but that's also significant. So for IEDs and abductions, in areas in which there were more deaths, there was less likely to be both of these uh, forms of political violence. Okay. 
Lastly, limiting um, the sample to just the election month to be able to look at the gender aspect of um, how, many, how many women did well in the election as well as how close the election actually was. Um, really, that narrows the sample down to 70, uh, an N of 75, so it's uh, really hard to kind of, I really don't have that much variation to work with. And basically, um, the non labor force and non-agricultural jobs, as well as population, increases uh, the likelihood of having an IED. So that, that basically is uh, significance. Substantive significance, that's something different. So looking at what is the best predictor in, a, in li actually likely likelihood of actually having violence, being in the Tarai, uh, more than doubles your probability of having a, a, an IED. Illiteracy, moving in from one standard deviation. So basically, moving along the range of illiteracy within Nepal, which is still not too good to begin with, but from 33% below the mean to 30. 34% below the mean to 34% above the mean increases the probability of uh, having an IED substantially by over 600%. So that was a, that and population, by increasing it that amount, uh, it was the largest substantive significance out of all the variables I included. So basically the structural variables, um, getting more towards pachinko, I guess maybe, than, than in, um, uh, God, what's a pink, not pinball. 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 I would keep on wanting to say ping pong. Um, so looking at it in a different way, the largest bars, I mean the, the most significance, it's illiteracy in population, has the largest effect. Uh, and you see population over the range, one standard deviation below to one standard deviation above, you see it as the highest, uh, the highest um, increase, illiteracy, and then the labor force in non-agricultural jobs. Because something like 81% of uh, Nepal still works uh, in rural environments, in agricultural-based uh, economy. And so um, being outside of that in the population centers increases the probability of having violence. Now, of course, this is just one snapshot. So in trying to torture the data to give up the secrets and to see if I actually have something, I included a bunch of different measures of uh, violence as well as um, uh, ex ex explanatory variables for violence. Um, it's getting warm in here and, and I'm seeing more yawns, so I won't really go into that. The most important thing to stress is basically I have the best data. I tried other data that's cross-sectional. The findings were similar for population, but they're less robust. The most significant predictor that really plays into the explanations for what's going on in Nepal that I really want to do work on in the future is caste polarization. Nepal has a similar type of caste system than India does. and um, in a Civil War article that I found, they have a measure of how polarized a particular district is in, uh, um, in the caste system, right? It goes from zero to one. So if you're one, you basically uh, are all one caste. If you're zero, you basically, each one, each citizen is its own caste. And so I looked at it in a nonlinear way and similar to conflict dynamics, looking at ethnic polarization. And I find a really strong effect that those areas that have a mixed caste system are much more likely to have election violence, which I think is really interesting and plays into both the Nepali dynamics as well as something I'm interested in looking at more generally. So yeah, that, I have a bunch of other robustness checks in the paper. General conclusions, structural factors had the largest uh, substantive effect, uh, especially on illiteracy and population. And the evidence that I found, because most, most of the election violence literature is structural, what, what we find at the broad cross-national uh, level also applies at the subnational level. However, there's a lot of areas for future research, and I really don't think I did a good job at this stage at trying to map out election dynamics, the strategy that I was talking about earlier, as well as the legacy of conflict. So uh, I'm interested in your questions here uh, and thoughts. Definitely need to do more about strategy, as well as what the government did to actually enforce the rule of law within a country. Um, because I have a lot of data on what the opposition groups do. I don't have any data on what the government did. And that's a huge glaring omission and something that I'm sure Ben is going to point out quite rightly. And that you need to kind of look at that and I'm trying to think of ways to do that. Need to better define the subnational mechanisms, especially having to do with elections. 2013 election, quite different, similar to Nepal. 2013 was definitely different than 2007. What explains that? Uh, and then also, um, with that course that we taught 
to the, uh, that, uh, the workshop that we had with Nepal and Afghanistan, there's a number of different prediction tools that international organizations have that say, here's where's the highest risk of conflict. There really hasn't been any studies to say, are they good at this? And can we get a prediction to give organizations information? And so I'm really interested in evaluating the tools that exist and maybe develop some kind of mechanism myself to kind of say, what's the best way to predict this uh, that could help avoid the, the kind of um, scenes uh, that we saw uh, in the beginning of the talk. And then I also want to see if what I find in Nepal uh, occurs in other countries. I need to have more than one case study chapter for the book, and so I'm thinking of other ones. I'm trying to get at regional variation, um, cultural heritage, uh, colonial heritage variation at the subnational level. So anyway, I'll stop now. Definitely interested in your comments and questions, and thank you for listening to me talk. Thank you.